Oh, we need a dad joke to get going, though. We, we got to get a dad joke in here. Have you ever tried to catch fog? I have, but I, I missed. You know, where I grew up in my hometown, there was a, a factory where they made juice. And I actually applied for a job there. But unfortunately, uh, they fired me after a couple days and they just said I couldn't concentrate. I'm on this special diet, right? It's called a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. So clearly it didn't work very well. I'm just, just gaining weight. Okay. I think three, three at once is enough. Everyone can stop rolling their eyes. Um, we'll go ahead and get started on document uh, DPQ number seven. Let's see. New document, uh, new Google Doc. DPQ number eight. Number eight. Um, that last one was actually pretty good. Huh? Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Evaluate the relative importance of the different causes for the expanding role of the U.S. in the world in the period 1865 to 1910. So basically how America began to take a larger role in the world between the Civil War and World War One. Okay, well, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, let's go. Uh, let's see. Doc number one. What do we got here? Um, oh, you know what I should do? I, this is always... I, I forgot to do this in the last two. But we should definitely make sure we write down some things we know about the prompt before we read the documents. So... The United States expanding in the world between 1865 and 1910. I've already got on my brain, I'm thinking about the Philippines. Thinking of the Spanish-American War. I'm thinking of the uh, Portsmouth Treaty. That's the negotiations between Russia and Japan to end the Russo-Japanese War. Teddy Roosevelt took the lead on that. Um, so those are three things I'm thinking about that could potentially be used here. Maybe as outside evidence. I don't know. We'll find out. All right. Uh, document number one, treaty concerning the secession of the Russian possessions in North America by His Majesty, the Emperor of all the Russians, to the USA. Oh, this is how we got Alaska. We bought Alaska. Nice. Now, 1867. His Majesty agrees to cede to the United States by this convention immediately upon exchange of the ratifications thereof all the territory and dominion now possessed by his said, his said majesty on the continent of America and in all the adjacent islands, the same being contained within the geographic limits herein set forth. The inhabitants of the ceded territory, according to their choice, may return to Russia, or if they should prefer to remain, with the exception of unauthorized... Sorry about that. Uncivilized native tribes shall be admitted to the enjoyment of the rights and advantages and immunities of the citizens of the United States and shall be maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of liberty, property, religion. The uncivilized tribes will be subjected to such laws and regulations as the United States may from time to time adopt in regard to the tribes of their own countries. In consideration of the secession, if we're said the United States agrees to pay $7 million in gold. Wow, that's a lot of gold. So Doc 1 is Alaska. Uh, and that would be money. I'm, I'm just getting money vibes off this, right? We're talking about the payment. The purchasing. Uh, document two. Our country. Is it possible? It's possible future and present crisis. In 1885. I wonder what crisis he's talking about. <clears throat> I don't even know who this is. Josiah Strong. It seems to me that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxon race for an hour sure to come in the world's future. Heretofore, there has always been in history of the world a comparatively unoccupied land westward into which the crowded countries of the east have poured their surplus populations. But the widening waves of migration which millennia ago rolled east and west from the various valleys of the Euphrates meet today on our Pacific coast. There are no more new worlds. The unoccupied arable lands of the earth are limited and will soon be taken. The time is coming when the pressure of population on the means of subsistence will be felt here as it is now felt in Europe and Asia. Then will the world enter upon a stage of its history, the final competition of the races. Oh, okay, this is social Darwinism. Okay, never mind. Social Darwinism. Okay, 
I was going to say, I probably should have just looked at the italicized part. That would have made this a lot easier. Um, yeah, social Darwinism and manifest destiny. Cool. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan. Oh, this is the build a big navy guy. I remember. I remember reading about this guy when I took a push. Build a big navy. That's what this guy talked about. Um, to affirm the importance of distant markets and the relation to them of their own immense power of production implies logically the recognition of the link that joins their production and markets. That is carrying trade. The three together constitute that chain of maritime power to which Great Britain owes her wealth and greatness. Further, it is too much to say that two of these links, like the shipping and the markets, I'm going to zoom in here really quick, um, are exterior to our own borders. The acknowledgement of them carries with the view of relations of the United States. Okay, so this is just a lot of talk. Um, he's, okay, so he's saying that the U.S. needs to build a big navy. Right, so Great Britain built a big navy, and therefore she's wealth and powerful. Despite a certain great original superiority conferred by our geographical nearness and immense resources, our natural advantage, the United States is woefully unready, not only for the fact, but in purpose to assert in the Caribbean and Central America a weight of influence proportional to the extent of her interest. We have not the navy, and what is worse, we are not willing to have the navy that would weigh seriously in any dispute with those nations to whose interests we will conflict with our own. We have not, and we are not anxious to provide the defense of the seaboard, which will leave the Navy free for its work at sea. We have not, but many other powers have, positions either within or the borders of the Caribbean. Okay, well, that's interesting. This is right before the Spanish-American War, I might add. So this is like, you know, build a big Navy, basically. Build a big Navy so that we might be great, right? Build the ships, build the ships. Naval power, but yo, naval power, which, by the way, Alfred Thayer Mahan would be very happy to know the United States has the largest navy in the world. It's bigger than the next 17 navies put together. That's how big it is. Our navy, there's nowhere the U.S. Navy does not patrol. All right. Uh, document four. Oh, look at that. Oh, this is right in the middle of the Spanish-American War. Let's see. We got a... <laughs> I like this. Uh, we got a Uncle Sam sitting at a, what looks like a restaurant. Uh, like he's ready to eat, and he's got the menu, the Cuba steak, the Puerto Rico pig, the Philippine floating islands, the sandwich, oh, they, they've turned all those territories into food. Well, I hardly know which to take first, and there's President McKinley, president at the time, ready to take his order, um, indicating that, uh, well, I guess we're gonna really, uh, gonna really, uh, I don't, I don't really know what I'm, so it looks like the idea is that Uncle Sam is feeling expansionist, right? Going to take some territory. But how to interpret this? I guess the thing is the the perception, I suppose, that these things are like somehow up for sale or up for grabs, right? The fact that they're on a menu that you could like choose from, that's a little odd. Um, the territory is ripe for the picking, is uh, ripe to be plucked. <clears throat> That's, that is interesting. That is interesting. I love that McKinley's dressed like a waiter. Oh, wait, you know what else I just noticed? Uncle Sam's hat looks like uh, it might have cannon sticking out of it at the bottom. I can't really tell with any certainty, but that could be down there. I don't know. Let's see. Document 5. John Hay, Secretary of State, second open door note. Oh, okay. Okay, this is China. This is China stuff. To the representatives of the United States at Berlin, London, Paris, Rome, St. Petersburg, Tokyo, and Tokyo, from Washington, 1900. In this critical posture of affairs in China, it is deemed appropriate to define the attitude of the United States as far as the present circumstances permit this to be done. We adhere to the policy of peace with the Chinese nation, of furtherance of lawful commerce and protection of lives and property of our citizens, by all means guaranteed under the extraterritoriality rights, uh, treaty rights, and by the laws of nations. We regard the condition of Peking as one of virtual anarchy. <clears throat> the purpose of the president is to act concurrently with the other powers, 
first in opening up communication with Peking and rescuing American officials and missionaries and the other Americans who are in danger, second in affording all possible protection everywhere to China and American life. Okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so this is in the middle of the Boxer Rebellion. So this is Boxer Rebellion territory, I believe. Um, I believe. When was the Boxer Rebellion? I'm pretty sure this is the Boxer Rebellion. I could be mistaken, right? But this is the open door policy. And the whole idea is we need to keep China available for trade, right? So if you kind of are looking at this, a peace with the Chinese nation, lawful commerce, protection of lives and property, guaranteed under treaty rights of the lawful nation. So it's, it, there's a really heavy emphasis here on keeping order and uh, furthering trade, right? Uh, to aid in preventing the spread of disorders to other provinces of the empire, right? Hence, we want to keep China uh, secure, right? <clears throat> uh, protect all rights and guarantee their friendly powers. So the other thing is, so this is saying that they want to keep China safe, secure, and uh, a a able to trade with, right? Now, if they were just saying this to themselves or to China, that would be one thing. But notice who they're saying this to, right? This is Germany, Great Britain, France, Italy, Russia, and Japan. Right, they're saying that hey, look, um, you don't you you can't take any more Chinese territory. We need to uh, we got to keep China open for business. Okay, you can't be taking territory. Not right. Can't do it. Interesting, interesting. Oh, satirical magazine, nineteen oh one. That's a weird looking. That's the creepiest looking Uncle Sam I've ever seen. Ooh. Huh. It's up to them. Uncle Sam to the Filipinos. You can take your choice. I have plenty of both. So that looks like a soldier with a gun and a school teacher uh, with some books. So I, I'm guessing that notice how up to them is in air quotes. I think uh, I think that's not really a choice, but it's being implied that they have a choice, but that if they don't choose correctly, or they don't do what Uncle Sam wants, he has the uh, threat of force behind him, right? Because he's got this soldier right here uh, with a gun. And notice that the Filipinos, none of them have guns. One of them has a sword, but they don't have any guns. Um, this woman with books. Okay, so this also sort of, sort of smacks a little bit of social Darwinism, but also of military power, right? So we've got both, uh, you know, we've got both, you know, we've got uh, some social Darwinism and some military might. Interesting. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with this one yet. I guess we'll, we'll figure it out when the time is right. Oh, geez. Well, this is long. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, annual message to Congress. Uh, oh, boy. These are the kinds of peace. There are kinds of peace which are highly undesirable, which are in the long run as destructive as any war. Tyrants and oppressors have many times made wildernesses and called it peace. Many times people who are slothful or timid or short-sighted who have been enervated, in enervated? Enervated. I have never heard this word before. Enervated. What does that even mean? An enervated? I gotta look that up. Hang on. I have never heard of this word. I feel like I, I hear about a lot of words, but I've never heard of this word. Enervated. That is so strange. Okay, it means to be weakened. To I mean. Yeah, I, I can. I figured that out from context clues, but like, I've never heard that word before. Enervated, enervated, huh? Well, you learn something new every day. Look at that. Okay, where were we? Sorry. Um, by ease or by luxury, or misled by false teachings, have shrunk in an unmanly fashion from doing duty that was stern and that needed self sacrifice, and have sought to hide from their own minds their shortcomings or ignoble motives by calling them love of peace. So. This is 1904. 
There's no war going on in the United States. But this was Teddy Roosevelt who did believe very strongly in the power of the United States to wage war when it needed to. So clearly there is a... Uh, he's got something on his mind. But uh, I'm, not sure what, I'm not really sure what it is. But he definitely seems to be talking about how like war is good, right? War is a good thing. It's okay to have war. It is our duty to remember that a nation has no more right to do injustice to another nation, strong or weak, than an individual has to do injustice to another individual. That same moral law applies in one case as another. But we must also remember that it is as much the duty of the nation to guard its own rights and its own interest as is the duty of the individual to do so. So don't break the rules, but we also have the right to protect our interests. Okay. It is not true that the United States feels any land hunger or entertains any projects as regards to the other nations of the Western Hemisphere, save such as are their welfare. <clears throat> All that this country desires is to see the neighboring countries stable, orderly, and prosperous. Oh my. Well, what would you need to do to make sure they are stable, orderly, and prosperous? Any country whose people conduct themselves well can count upon our hearty friendship. If a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political manners, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence. <laughs> impotence. I love this, this wording. Uh, which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may, in America, as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation and the exercise of international police power. Okay, so we don't want to interfere, but we will if we have to. Don't make us do it. Don't make us do it. Uh, okay, that is interesting. Uh, we got some more social Darwinism here. Uh, also, just a hint of police power. Some, some, you know, we got some military power. He says police power. Huh. Okay. Uh, so how do we? I'm trying to figure out how to how to kind of bring these all together, all these documents. Um, interesting. So I, th I guess I'm sort of I'm noticing a couple of uh, I'm noticing a couple of trends here. Um, I'm noticing I think I'm seeing three prongs of argumentation, kind of going through all of these. Um, it's also kind of interesting. This one has two pictures. Most DBQs only have one picture, if they have any pictures at all. Um, this one has two. That's interesting. That's different. All right. So let me just get the prompt again. So the importance of the different causes of the expanding role of the U.S. Okay. So the importance of the different causes of the expanding role of the U.S. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's switch on over here. Okay. All right, so causes, the different causes. Um, I'm seeing three causes. I'm seeing uh, diplomatic power, uh, military power, and social Darwinism. Um, diplomacy. So I guess the the importance of the difference the varying importance so like i guess which one is the most important versus which one is the least important that is interesting that is very interesting okay well let's uh let's take it on so in terms of diplomacy i've got document one which was the note about uh buying alaska and i've got document five <clears throat> which is the note about the Boxer Rebellion or the open door policy. Um, let's see. In terms of military power, I've got document three, 
I've got document seven and I've got, um, where is it? Uh, document six, the one with the, fill actually, no, we got um, the uh, document four. Uh, and then in terms of the social Darwinism, we get document two, which is pretty on the nose. Uh, document six, yeah, there we go. We got our three, three prongs of argumentation. So let's just really quick get a thesis down before we start writing. Awesome. Also notice that I've taken about 22 minutes to plan. So never, never worry about planning more and writing less. It's all good. Okay, let's zoom in here. Okay, um, thesis statement. Um, between the years, within the time period 1865 to 1910, the United States expanded its role as a world power through several means uh because of because of several causes the most important being military power such as a large such as a large navy um <clears throat> a large navy the ideas of social Darwinism, as seen through, uh, what was his name's speech? What's that guy's name? The speech. Um, what's that guy's name? Uh, Josiah Strong. What a great name. Josiah Strong. As seen through Josiah Strong's speech and the diplomatic maneuvering diplomatic agreements such as the purchase of Alaska cool there we go got a thesis uh, oh boy uh, you know what I need a joke before I get into this because I'm just I am falling asleep here okay so let me ask you all all of y'all in chat here's a quick question um, what's brown and sticky I bet you can't answer this one. What's brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> it's a stick. It's brown and sticky. It's a stick. Awesome. All right. All right. Just needed that one to get us going. Just needed that one to get us going. All righty, so let's begin with paragraph one. We'll start with uh, military power. Paragraph. Also, I just figured out what that Roosevelt speech was about. That was the Roosevelt corollary. I'd forgotten about that. I just figured out that's what that was. Um, so paragraph number one. one the most... The most important cause of American expansion was the growth and construction of military power in the late 19th century. For example, let's see, we got uh, document three. Um, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan explained that America needed to build a large oops, scroll down navy in order to protect her interests in the region 
as doc3. This book was immensely popular in the U. Oops. Okay. Let's adjust our seating. I'm losing. Was immensely popular. Was immensely popular in the United States and would go on to influence the construction policy of the Department of the Navy. Um, and help win support for a larger funding of the Navy. Additionally, the book draws a comparison with Great Britain, at the time the most powerful nation in the world, with the purpose of rousing support in order to surpass them in naval dominance. Uh, there we go. I don't think I'm, it's a purpose statement. I can modify it and come back to it later. Um, this militarist attitude would also be seen one year later during the desire, during the Spanish-American War, in which the U.S. acquired Spanish territory in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. Acquired. Now, let's see, when was the date of that cartoon? Number three, in May. I believe, you know, I can't remember exactly when this when the Maine was blown up. <sighs> to hell with the Spain, remember the Maine. I can't remember quite when the Maine blew up, but I feel like it was later than May. So I'm going to guess that this the cartoon probably came actually before the Spanish-American War. The cartoon in document three depicts Uncle Sam eyeing the Spanish territories as if they were up for grabs. As if they only needed to be purchased at a restaurant. The implication being that American power would easily would allow them to easily take the territory. Asia only need to be purchased as if at a restaurant. It's document uh, five. American power would. Uh, you know, I could be wrong. I. Uh, hmm. Let's see. This not tie this. Uh, this militarist attitude will be on display a year later in the Spanish-American War. Hum, bum, bum, bum. Right, so I have described this document. Uh, the Spanish Empire was indeed weak at this point, and the United States had been trying to acquire Cuba for a very long time and the growth in military power meant the time was now right to seize the place see not to seize the place seize the territory from Spain
It's true, actually. The U.S. have been trying to acquire Cuba for a very long time. But again, I don't, that's not a hip statement right there. Um, this new position was semi-formalized with a speech by Teddy Roosevelt in 1904, which <clears throat> outlined American policy in the region, claiming the right to interfere in other nations if need be. That the United States president, president felt certain enough to proclaim this reflects the shift in American military power that they need not fear, whoops, scroll down, they need not fear intervention by other powers in the region, other powers such as the British in the region. This declaration is known as the Roosevelt Corollary and is an addition to the existing U.S. Monroe Doctrine, which was proclaimed 70 or er, proclaimed. 80 years before it. Oh, next feeling just a little bit stiff. Uh, which was claimed 80 years before it. Uh, that doctrine had reflected that doctrine which prevented recolonization of the Americas reflected growing American nationalism was now backed up by military might. Dope. Cool. Which was also used to interfere in a lot of countries. Still need that hip statement, though. We haven't done any of those hip statements. Okay. Uh, we got military power. Let's talk diplomatic. We'll do diplomatic stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll do the diplomacy next. Um, another important... Important... <clears throat> cause for American expansion was diplomatic efforts to acquire territory or prevent conquest of other territory. For example, the U.S. purchased Alaska from the Russian government for about $7 million in gold. It's a lot of gold in 1867. 1867. This purchase oops, reflected a strong desire to expand the territory of the U.S. in part because 
the country had just spent tons of money fighting a civil war, which is true. The civil war had just ended. So uh, clearly there's a, a great dedication. Um, and this purchasing price must have seemed prohibitive. Still, the U.S. purchased the territory. Anyhow. Hmm, let's see. Um, let me take a look back at the document. I think we'll do a hip statement here, but I want to make sure that uh, I'm analyzing it correctly. So this is the treaty. Um... It was very probably not written by the emperor of Russia themselves. Um, 7,200,000 gold. Um, something like that. Well, okay. Um, let's see. Purpose. The purpose, the point of view, the intended audience of the treaty. Hmm. Well, I'll think about it. I'll come back to it. Um, Additionally, the U.S. used its diplomatic muscle to prevent the full colonization of China by the European powers and Japan during the Boxer Rebellion in 1900 that would be document seven let's see document no which document was it five document five during document five boop, 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 boop. uh do, 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 during document five this uh, diplomatic effort was mainly to allow for continued trade with China by Americans. You can trade with China by Americans who would have been excluded from the region if China <clears throat> became a formal colony of any of the other great powers. Therefore, the purpose of the telegram was to convince the other great powers. Ah, you know what? That doesn't sound good. I'm just going to have to come back at the end and do all the hip statements because I just, I'm so, I don't know what it is. I can't, uh, none of them are coming to me right now. Became a colony of the other great powers. As an informal colony, the U.S. could still access Chinese markets. This access, actually, no, I have one right here. This access to Chinese markets also explains part of the reason for the U.S.'s acquisition of the Philippines. The Philippines which allowed Americans to have a base of operations geographically close to China. Actually, not even just the Philippines and 
Hawaii, though that's not the only reason, um, to have it geographically close to China and a stopping point on the return journey across the Pacific. There's some context. This reveals that while diplomacy is important, it is secondary to military might in being able to able to allow expansion. Oh boy. Let's see. I got one context statement. All right. The final cause of American expansion in the world would be the ideals of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. In particular, the works of Josiah Strong, which claimed that America had a special... Oops, I need to scroll down. America had an epic... I guess epic works. Had an epic destiny and would need to... Let's see, what did he say exactly? If I'm going to describe this, I want to describe it correctly. Um, let's see. Um... Let us hope with the largest liberty, the purest Christianity, the highest civilization, having developed particularly aggressive traits calculated to impress its institutions upon mankind, will spread itself over the earth. Okay, so he's arguing that the United States, by nature of its, uh, by nature of who it is, uh, will be able to impress itself. Uh, I would need to be forceful in in pushing its institutions upon the world. In particular, he is the references to other races make it clear that he that strong is referring to overseas colonies or territories. A view consistent with the social Darwinist ideas of European empires which justified their rule on Racial superiority. Okay, fix that really quick. Okay, um, and I think we get a little context. This idea is not entirely new to the United States. As it is implied in Strong's writings, uh, not entirely new. It is implied in Strong's writings that uh, the United, the or sorry, the concept of manifest destiny, the concept of manifest destiny, misspelled it, or that America should expand from sea to shining sea had shaped U.S. policy for decades up to this point and justified the extermination, the attempted extermination of Native Americans. context in there.
Let's see, this is document two. All right, last but not least, what do we got? Um, which other one? Oh, yeah. This threat of force is also visible in the dis in the illustrated cartoon in which Uncle Sam offers native Filipinos the choice between civilization or the threat of military force. It's document five, I think. Document five. No, it's document six. What threat of military force? That's document six. <clears throat> the willingness to use brutal tactics against a peoples which the US fought side by side to liberate liberate from Spanish rule reflects the sentiment that they are not worthy of civilization that they I shouldn't say they're not worthy they need to be civilized they need to be civilized and if not then they deserve violence pushed upon them I had something else I wanted to say. Um, I felt like I was going to add something else to, onto that. Well, actually, we can just do some context. This would be the case from the case in the early 1900s. Whoops, 1900s when the Filipinos Filipinos rebelled against newly established <clears throat> American rule. And the US proceeded to wage a violent war of suppression against them. Against the against them. I shouldn't say against them. That's not technically being correct. Filipino. Um, proceed to wage a violent war of suppression against Filipinos, which included the use of torture and summary executions. Such brutality reflected the norms of a society of a society seeped in social Darwinist values, period. That's also context, by the way. I guess we're just doing context here because it's easiest for me right now. And I am just so tired. I'm My brain is melting. Okay, uh, not quite done, though. Context, context. All right. Now it's, it's getting starting to get dark outside. Um, let's see. The one of the principal simple causes of the American Revolution was the attempt by the British to prevent settlement east of the Rockies. No, not the Rockies, the Appalachian. The Appalachians, right? Is that how you spell Appalachian Mountains. 
Nope, that's not Eastbound. Appalachian Mountains. Appalachian Mountains. Really? Principal with an A? Anyways. Um, the colonists had felt it was their right to settle that land after the war with the French. They felt it was their right to take that land after their war with the French. This sentiment of expansion would justify further wars with Britain and Mexico and only be interrupted by the U.S.'s own civil war. By the late 18th century, the U.S. was beginning to play a larger role in world affairs, period. See, the funny thing is in AP World, this is all one time period. Like this is definitely, I'm talking about three different time periods um, in AP US, but like in AP World, this is all just one time period, almost all one time period. Um, now, I don't know if this is sufficient contextualization. I feel like it is. Um, I feel like it is, but you know what? Maybe I'm totally off on that. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, with about seven minutes to go, I think, I think we got it. We got, let's see, context, context, more context, outside evidence being the Roosevelt Corollary, and the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, I think we're good. I don't know if this is a terribly complex, there's not a lot of nuance here, but um, we can't get all the points, but we're going to. Like I said, we're going to aim for... Uh, oof, my ears are bugging me. Nine hours in these things. Whoosh. Okay. All right. Well, we got one more. Uh, boy, I think we could definitely use a dad joke <laughs> real quick after talking about American expansionism. Let's see. Um, well, let me ask you this. Here's a brain teaser. Here's a, here's a riddle for you. If you see somebody robbing an Apple store, does that make you an eyewitness? I feel like I, I feel like someone should know the answer to that. Does that make you an eyewitness? What happens when a strawberry gets run over crossing the street? Anybody know? Anybody know? It's a traffic jam. A traffic jam. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, we need a laugh after that last DBQ. <laughs> okay, this is this is easy. Everyone should get this. I know everyone's heard this one at least a thousand times. What do you call uh, fake noodles? What do you call fake noodles? This one, everybody knows this one. We got to get this one. Impasta, yes. Everybody knows that. Okay, we, we got that one. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so I really need to go to the bathroom. I haven't gone in about six hours. So I'm going to be right back. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to transition to our final, final, I didn't think we'd ever get here, our final DBQ of the night. And we'll read the top of the hour statement as soon as I get back. So just give me a minute. Just give me, yeah, just give me one minute. Be right. Where's my... We're going to open up another. Must be 